Thank you for joining our broadcast today. We want you to be free to hear from God, and we pray that His blessing would be on your life. We're a church that's on mission across the aisle, across the street, and around the world. We believe the gospel changes everything. God bless you. Tiffany, 
And uh, Tiffany has made that decision to follow after Christ in the past. And so today she's being obedient in believer's baptism. Tiffany, have you accepted Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. Well, upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I now baptize you, my sister, Tiffany Barrett, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ to the death, raised to walk in the newness of life. And this is Matt, and Matt, Matt also comes today um, claiming that he's accepted Christ to be his Lord and Savior in the past, and he's also here today to be obedient to believers' baptism. Matt, have you accepted Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. Upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I now baptize you, my brother, Matt Webb, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in the dead, raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen. It's always a good day to see baptisms. Amen. 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 Give him glory for that. That's all right. This is their public testimony. This is their testimony to you as uh, having Christ in their life and becoming part of our fellowship. So what a wonderful day to see that. I um, hope you're glad to be here this morning. I'd like to welcome you. My name's Nathan. I'm the pastor, worship pastor here, and uh, it's my privilege to welcome you this morning. Happy Mother's Day as well. And uh, if you guys, if you don't know it's Mother's Day, it's Mother's Day, all right? So go out and get that card or get that flower arrangement. But uh, for those of you um, who have mothers uh, here, uh, honor them today. If they've already passed on and are in heaven, we honor them as well today uh, in our worship and in our praise, uh, glorifying God for them and their, their lives and what they have done. Uh, for us, for our families, and you, if you are a mother here this morning, we want to uh, thank you so much for all that you've done, and uh, thank you for your, your, uh, your commitment, your dedication to your family, and uh, my wife is probably watching down in Florida right now. I thank her as well, and uh, praise God for her uh, being a mother of four boys. I know that can be hard sometimes. Amen? All right. Well, happy Mother's Day, and uh, we hope you have a great one today, and uh, thank you all for being here. Let's stand, and let's have a little bit of fellowship, and let's do something a little different. Let's find somebody you don't know, and shake, the, shake their hand, hug them around the neck, introduce yourself to them this morning. <laughs> Check this out, 1,977 years, 134 days, 16 hours, and 28 minutes ago. Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus simply answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The message says, love the Lord your God with all your passion, prayer, and intelligence. You see, our love for God must be sincere, not just by the words we speak, but also by engaging our souls truly love God, we must be passionate about Him, inside and out. The only way to follow this command is to make loving God our first priority. That means everything else takes a back seat. But there's more. Oh, this weekend was a bad idea. You remember what happened last time we watched the kids? I'm not a pinata! Get it off me! Get it off <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna need help.
warning, use of this product may alter your perception of reality. All right, everything looks the same. This is a joke. Guys, 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 it's like the Sahara in this cup. Can somebody hit me with some juice? <laughs> and listen, pulp, no pulp, doesn't make a difference to me. You're the ones dealing with the diaper. Mom goggles. Beautiful! <laughs> okay, sweetie, I need you to sit on your bottom. Listen to Daddy and sit on your bottom, okay? Daddy's gonna come get you. Don't move. Don't dance. Just sit on your bottom. Daddy's gonna come get you. Whoa, 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 whoa! Don't you try to stop me. Baby made a poopy, yes you did, dude. Where are your mom goggles? They wouldn't fit over my hazmat suit. Take this. Oh, oh. You're so cute, dude. Uh -huh. And then the little boy <laughs> rocked his mommy. Oh, I love you. Forever! I like you too! <laughs> <sighs> I don't know how they do it. Oh, well you take it and you fold it from corner to corner. No, I'm... I'm asking the question, how do moms do all of this? How do they handle it all? Well, maybe they have goggles we don't know about. It's as if God gave moms a special way of looking at things, you know? Okay, who taught you servanthood? Who modeled grace? Who gave you a taste of what God's love could look like? My mom, Mr. T, and my mom. Anyway, I, I just think God gave moms a special way of looking at things. Hey, honey. Hey, how's it going at home? It's all good. Guess you could say I'm um, starting to catch a glimpse of what your world looks like. Oh, really? Yeah. Mama. Hold on, your daughter wants to say something to you. I did, Mama. She says she misses you. And she realizes how important you are in her life. And she doesn't know how you do it. And she knows that she can't make it without you. She said all that, huh? I don't know if she said it. But it's what I wanted to say. And I should have said it a lot sooner. I thank God for you. Twins. Um, it, it was nothing. Um, we we have to go. Okay. Um, lo love you, mommy. This place is like a pigsty. this morning as we continue our worship oh god our help in ages past sing this hymn out to him this morning oh god our help in ages past our hope for years to come our shelter from the stormy blast and our return home. under the shadow of thy throne Sufficient is our 
He is worthy. And he is mighty to save. He is the only one worthy to say that. Amen? He died on that cross to offer us that salvation. And he was the only one that could do that. He is mighty to save. Let's sing this song out. Lifting him up this morning. Sing it out. Everyone needs. Everyone needs compassion. A love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. The kindness of a Savior. The
us. We thank you, God, for your name, in the name of Jesus. God, we just want to come this morning and praise you. We want to just lift you up. You're so good to us, God. You've given us so very much. And all we can come and do is to lift you up and worship you and praise you and give you all the honor and glory that you deserve. We, we ask that you come into this place this morning, Lord, and that you, that you move in hearts and you change lives this morning. And God, we praise you and thank you, as I said, and all of it in Jesus' name. We thank you and love you. Amen. Lift this song to him this morning. He is stronger than anything we can imagine. Sing this out. There is love that came for us. Humble to a sinner's cross. You broke my shame and sinfulness.
Necessities, you know, food, water, shelter, and just recently he's, you know, paid for the whole India trip, which is, you know, an amazing blessing. I'm really excited about India. It's going to be an, um, an amazing, eye-opening experience. In Genesis 28, uh, starting in verse 20, it says, "Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go." and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you." As we see here, Jacob's giving 10% of what he has. I would tell someone who's considering to give, you know, just, just pray about it, and if God leads you to give, then you know, start giving. Amen. Thank you for that testimony, David. Let's prepare our hearts for our offertory as the ushers come forward. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Lord, as we celebrate Mother's Day this morning, we want to celebrate you most of all. We thank you for them. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you, to give to you. 
because Lord we know that everything we have is from you Lord as this next song says Lord all we can boast of is you Lord we have our lives we have our careers we have our families our wives our children Lord everything we have Lord is from you every blessing every good and perfect thing comes down from the father of lights and Lord we know that we don't deserve the salvation you have given us we don't deserve any blessing but Lord while we were yet sinners and unlovable you died for us so that, that righteousness that holy righteousness could be imputed into us Lord that's what we boast of this morning we boast of you we lift you up we praise your name and Lord as we offer these songs these prayers these testimonies and this giving to you Lord let it be a, a small token of our praise to you in Jesus name we pray amen was a gift freely given righteousness for the weak sent from heaven with your strength by your grace we stand forgiven we lift high Jesus Christ the name of freedom all we could offer our filthy rags of shame till we receive your grace a glorious hope in exchange oh, our only boast is the cross all our hope is christ in Yeah. 
Ethan and the team. And, you know, Easter, I think you're getting it that Easter's every day. And uh, we've been extending our Easter sermon for four weeks now, or three, three or four weeks, but it's really a lifetime. So we're going to continue with Easter today because it is every day. And the Bible says, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, nor the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts that he understands and knows me, talking about God. So mothers, it, we're going to boast today because we love you, but we're going to boast in the God who made you and created you for a purpose, and your purpose is being fulfilled in our family. So thank you very much, and we appreciate you very much, and we'll do baby dedication on Father's Day. That even sounds a little better, doesn't it? Every day is Mother's Day. Listen carefully. Every day is Father's Day, and every day is Easter. Isn't that right? That's what the Bible says. It's not a holiday. It's not a day we celebrate. It's a life we live. So if you have your Bibles, as we have sung these songs so beautifully about God being stronger and our sins are forgiven and boast only in the cross, you're going to see it in the text. So Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, will continue in our series about Easter. So if you'll stand out of honor and respect of God's Word, and then we'll jump into the text. <clears throat> Don't leave the songs that you have sung. Let those songs rise in your heart. Even as we teach, let the Word rise in your heart. God's Word is active and living and sharper than any two-edged sword. So we're praying that God would cut today with the sharp sword. And here it is. And you, being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, <clears throat> he has made you alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements, your text may say certificate of debt, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has, listen, taken it away, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities, powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Father, take your word. Take the songs, take the message, take the testimony, take the giving. Use it all to bring us to a point of total surrender. We trust you for the words. We trust you for this message. Teach me as I seek to teach others. We submit to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Death. Alive, dead and alive. We've been seeing this in Easter, dead and alive. Several years ago, there was a, a tremendous explosion down in the deep coal mines in West Virginia. And USA Today came out with a, a very uh, exciting report at the end of the day because uh, out of the 13 miners that were trapped, 12 of them were still alive. And so they came out, and it was all over the news, if you'll remember it. There was one person who was dead because of the explosion. And so they came out at the end of the day hearing voices down in the coal mine that these men are alive. And the next day, USA Today and the reporters that made that report pulled that report and said, we're sorry, we made a mistake. All of them are dead. And so we went from celebration in a small community town and churches ringing their bells in West Virginia to the fate of they are not alive, they're really dead. We thought they were alive, but we actually shouldn't have reported on that, so we would draw our report and we tell you that they are dead. I want to tell you this morning, the hope of the gospel is there will never be a time when we come back to you and tell you that Jesus is not alive. We will never go back on the report. This is a written report of the fact that he died he was buried on the third day, and he rose again, and there will never be a day when we will say he is dead. That's why we've been singing songs of praise, songs of the glory of the cross, songs of he is stronger, man. He is stronger. Who's stronger? Freeman? No, Freeman is not stronger. The Bible tells us that we should be weaker and weaker and weaker, that his strength would be made perfect or stronger and stronger in me. So Paul tells us today about this resurrection in Colossians chapter 2, 13 through 15. So when you think of death and alive, you gotta, you gotta balance the two. And, and so you'll never have that report that he's dead, he's alive. That's why Easter is every day. That's why Mother's Day is every day and Father's Day. And by the way, you do know this, don't you? What's next? Grandparents' Day? Groundhog Day? What, what? You know Hallmark makes a lot of money, don't you? I, that's as far as I'm gonna say on that. That's no excuse, but I'm just telling you. And you, verse 13, I want, to give you, I want to give you three pictures here today, just three pictures, 
of the gospel. Complete salvation, complete forgiveness, and complete victory. Complete salvation, verse 13. Complete forgiveness, verse 14. And complete victory, verse 15. So when you leave here today, you know for sure that he alone has rescued you. Okay, here we go. And you being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. And so he tells us two things here in verse 1 and verse 13. He says, you're dead. Uh, you're, you're dead. There, there is no hope for you. You are spiritually dead on the inside. There's a deadness to you. There's a deadness to me. We are all born that way. Fathers, mothers, children. We are dead. Okay? So he tells us we are dead. And then he says, in your, tr- in your trespasses, and the word trespasses or the word sins means to cross and go beyond known limits. Okay? When a child tells a parent, wouldn't happen on Mother's Day, when a child tells a parent no, nobody's confused on who the child is and who the parent is. The child knows the authority of the parent, but the child chooses out of his own free will because they are dead in sin and they are born sinners, that they have chosen to ignore the authority of the mother and chose to cross beyond known limits. That's the idea in the text here. That's what the word sins is or trespasses. It means to, to go beyond uh, known limits. To see, see, we know the authority of God. We know who God is, but we choose to trespass anyway. That's what the Bible says. And every one of us in here are trespassers. Every one of us in here have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So Paul is saying, and and he's speaking in the face of legalism to the church at Colossae, and he's saying, and you're dead in your trust, dead number one. So in a way, you're doubly dead because he's speaking mostly to Gentiles. Um, So the idea is they were uh, uh, not of the covenant and of the promise, so therefore um, they're they're dead. Uh, In their conscience, they have defied God. Um, The Jews certainly have defied God, and they were given the law, but either Gentile or Jew, it doesn't really matter. You're still dead. And so the idea is you're dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. So the idea would be um, the uncircumcision of the flesh. That represents the enemies of God. Okay? Uh, Remember when David was taunted by uh, Goliath, he said, you uncircumcised Philistine. What he was saying was, you're an enemy of God. And so what Paul is saying, not only are we dead, but we're enemies of God. And so nothing we can do to make ourselves stronger can help us get out of our dead state. It would be like, example, Charles Manson being in prison, trying to be a better prisoner, uh, sweeping the floors, wiping the bars, doing whatever he would do. He has a sentence judicially and and also morally. So the idea is he is uh, bankrupt. It doesn't matter what he, he may be a better prisoner than other prisoners, but the sentence still remains. And it's like you and I, we're dead and what dead people need is, is something very important. They need life. Dead people don't need help. They don't need a second chance. They need life. That's what dead people need. And, and Paul says that we're dead in the uh, uncircumcision of our flesh. So we're dead in our trespasses and in the uncircumcision of our flesh. We're enemies of God. And so we're not trying to become better people because dead people are dead. And that's what the word dead means. All right. And then he says, this is so beautiful. This is complete salvation. He has made you alive together, alive together with him Heaven forgiven you all trespasses. So we were dead in our trespasses and sins, in the uncircumcision of our flesh, but he, God makes people alive through Jesus Christ, through the resurrection. So he makes people alive together, here it is, with him. We talked about that phrase and that preposition, what it means to be connected with Christ. So death is not annihilation, death is separation. Death is not annihilation where you go into oblivion. Death is separation. In the garden, God said it was, they were separated. Adam and Eve were separated. Where are you? They were separated because of their sin. So death is separation. It, it's not annihilation. And so in the uncircumcision, he made you alive together with him. This last week, uh, I don't know how it happens at our house, but the robins, they build these nests. And um, we went away for vacation for one week, and we were fending them off from building a nest because we got two dogs. And they build the nest on the uh, back of our drains, uh, and, and uh, our pipes coming from the, from the roof. And, and we know that our dogs are going to be ready to get them because what happens is the little baby birds, they flop out of the nest and fall, and we have to go out and check whether they're dead or whether they're alive. 
And so these poor little birds, I mean, they're just, they're flopping and they can't run, they fall and they can't fly. And so I spent two days with my literal hands picking up little baby birds and they're snapping at me, snapping back. The one who wants to help them, they're defying his authority. So I told, I was chasing one, Freddie, I hope you didn't see this, he's my neighbor. And I'm out there in my shorts and my Black socks, which you shouldn't do back in my dad's day. You couldn't do that, but today it's in style. So, and I'm grab, and I told Leslie, this thing's snapping at me. Get my gloves, and she said I, something like "you pansy" or something like that. I don't know what she said, but I, I grabbed it and I took the bird and I put it in, in in a position to where he wouldn't get in trouble. And guess what? The next day I came to the front yard, just kind of looking because I had a feeling it was over and it was over. There was a pile of feathers because there was a cat who saw the alive bird, and that cat at night, which is orange, is the one, he's orange in color, and he came and ate that bird, so there was a pile. So I thought, what am I going to do with the next one? So basically, I come home for lunch, and we kind of get a report whether they are dead, whether they're alive, and Leslie told me, there he is right there, there he is. And she said, wave goodbye to that bird at lunch, because that bird will be no longer when you get home. Think about that. Dead versus alive. He made us, watch this, alive together with him. Listen carefully. The moment we get saved, the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're made alive. Just like that. Just that quick. Just that instantaneous. We are made alive forevermore. And we will always have Easter living in us because Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And so we know that. So he, you're made alive specifically, immediately, together with him. It's kind of like having a futon. If you had a futon, um, one of those chairs, if you have it in your basement or in your house, you just kind of fall into that futon and watch golf or watch baseball or football or whatever, and you kind of just feel at home. And the idea with salvation is we just, we're made at home. We fall into the futon of God's grace. We've been grafted in. We are connected with him. We're alive with him forevermore. That's what the Bible says. So on this Mother Day, Mother's Day, what would be so great if, if mothers and fathers and children would make sure they're alive together with him? Here it is. Having forgiven you all of your trespasses, all of your trespasses, forgiveness, the word forgiveness in the Greek means to send away, to have all of your sins gone. The idea would be sending those sins away. Uh, if you've ever been at a, a birthday party and they give you a balloon with some helium, you take that balloon. Have you seen them when the little kids let it go? And you look and you watch that balloon and you watch it and you watch it and pretty soon you can't see that. It's so far away. That's what God says. I am sending away, forgiving you all of your sins. Now, is it anybody's birthday today? Okay, don't ever say your pastor didn't ever have a cake for you. I'm celebrating all the birthdays that we've ever had here at First Baptist Alcoa. Because a birthday represents, what does a birthday represent? Life. I am, uh, this is Gigi's, this is expensive stuff. It's not two for four, it's two for ten. 15. So I want to show you something here. I've got a, I've got a birthday cake, uh, and I want you to take this scripture and understand that you've been made alive together with him, forgiven us, it says, all of our sins. Now, here's what we believe. We believe that Jesus forgave most of our sins, but when we get to the word all, there's some sins that we just don't think he's got enough power. He's not strong enough to really send those away into oblivion. We think that there are some sins that just keep coming back. So, let me see here, if I can pull this off. Don't ever say, your pastor, why isn't this working? Uh, if this goes, it's the, there's never any air up here. And, uh, okay, ah, oh, geez. Hang on just a second. Let me have a little time alone. I was born in, uh, I was born in Houston, and uh, I was married at the age of, come on, baby. Thank you, Lord. I was, uh, I was born, holy cow. <laughs> uh, for the sake of the illustration, that's all we're doing. I'm not going for the other one. But this, this idea is a birthday represents life. That's what a birthday represents. 
And so we sing happy birthday and then we blow out all the candles. And that's the idea of what Jesus does with our sin. When we are made alive together, excuse me, when we are made alive together with him, that he has forgiven us, not only were we dead in the uncircumcision, the text of our flesh, and we're dead in our sins and trespasses, but he has forgiven us all. So we think of this, that Jesus blows all of our sin away. He, he takes, but, and we think that he takes care of these big ones for the sake of, uh, uh, I hope the alarms stay off right now, but for the sake of this illustration, we really believe that he takes care of the big things, and he can blow those out. But he keep, but these little sins that, that we think that he didn't forgive us for the little stuff, and that stuff keeps coming back, and it keeps haunting us. Can I tell you why some of you are doubting your salvation this morning? Because you don't believe Jesus blew out that candle. You really believe it's up to you to take care of that and keep blowing it out because... <clears throat> now, excuse me just a second while I take care of this. So do you understand what we're talking about here in this text? That's what the text says. It says, having forgiven... Here's what the text says. I want you to look at it. Having forgiven... We're still in verse 13. Having forgiven all our trespasses. He's forgave all of our trespasses. So, so the idea that Paul was dealing with in Colossae was this, and this is very important to understand. He was dealing with legalism, and here's what legalism is. Legalism says it's Christ plus something else that makes you okay. And Paul was saying it's Christ plus nothing because Jesus is the one that fulfilled the law and he now lives in you. So Paul was saying, having forgiven you all of your trespasses, sending away all your trespasses, blowing out all your candles for those candles to never haunt you anymore. That's what Paul's saying. Having forgiven us all of our trespasses. And so here's my question to you. Are you known for the laws that you keep or the Lord that you love? Having forgiven all of our sins, he's made us alive together with him. We're alive in Jesus Christ today. There's nothing, nobody can take that away. Mother's Day is a happy day because our sins have been forgiven and they have been blown out and they don't keep reappearing. We don't take a slice of the cake and say, if I obey here, then I'm okay. If I cut this piece out, I obey here, then I'm okay. No, the Bible says we're okay because he's okay and he's stronger and he's forgiven all of our trespasses. Complete salvation, verse 13. Verse 14, complete forgiveness. Here it is. Having wiped out, look at the text, the certificate of debt that was against us and was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So Paul says there's a certificate of debt, having wiped it out. So the idea would be that, that the slate's been wiped clean because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, not because of us, but because he blew out all the candles and he's the God of our life now that, that this certificate of debt, the certificate of debt is what we had to pay for our sin. Let me tell you a couple of things about the certificate of debt. Number one, a prisoner in Rome, when they would go serve in their prison cell, their time, the, por the court reporter would take the certificate of debt and nail it to the prison door. And when that prisoner finished that certificate of debt and paid the price for his or her sin, then that court reporter would take that uh, certificate of debt, roll it up, and when the last day was served in prison, they would give that prisoner that certificate of debt, and he would walk out never to be convicted of those crimes ever again. The picture is powerful. It's a word picture. Because of Jesus Christ being nailed to the cross and taking on the sin that you and I should have to pay for, we have a certificate of debt that we can no longer be counted for our sins. We have imputed righteousness. There was a virus that was loose after the resurrection, and the virus is this. It went worldwide. The virus is this. We get imputed righteousness because of not having to pay for our sins, and he paid for our sins. He took care of the certificate of debt. It was nailed to the cross, and we are forgiven full and free. So that's what the uh, certificate would stand for. Also, in this text, it talks about the handwriting of requirements in the uh, New King James, certificate of debt, same thing. You, you, if you owed a debt, if you owed a debt, what they would do back in biblical days is they would take your name. If you didn't pay your debts, they would put your name in the city square, big on a placard, and they would put your name there, and you couldn't do business with anybody until you paid that debt. Isn't the word picture powerful? 
There's a certificate of debt that has been paid for my sin and your sin. It says here and in verse 14, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now, we think of the cross as defeat, but the cross is not defeat. The cross is victory, and the resurrection is the culmination of the cross being the victory in Jesus Christ. Think about it. having nailed it to the cross. For some of you today, you're haunted by the ghost of your past. You're haunted by it. You understand it was nailed to the cross, but you don't think all of it was nailed to the cross. You think some of it was nailed to the cross. And therefore, when we sing, when we worship, you're still carrying the guilt of your past. And I want to tell you something. Based on the authority of God's Word, I didn't write this. Paul says he took all of our sins and nailed it to the cross, not in part, but the what? Whole. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more praise the tells us what we just sang. It was nailed to a cross. You know what would make Mother's Day special? Is if you settled it in your heart and in your mind today that all of your sins have been forgiven. Can I tell you how a mother and a child relate? Forgiveness. Is that not right? That's what a marriage is. You relate in forgiveness. That's how it is. And Paul says the way you relate to God is by understanding his forgiveness. Colossians 2, 13 is about complete salvation. We were dead, now we've been made alive. Uh, verse 14 talks about the certificate of debt being uh, nailed, uh, taken out of the way, and, and, and nailed to the cross, the song we just sang, how beautiful that is. And then verse 15 is complete victory. This is the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. Here's what Paul says. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. The triumphing over them in it is the triumph of the cross. He made a public spectacle. The cross was public. It was a public spectacle of the victory. We think it was defeat. It's not defeat because Jesus said, it is finished. I have completed. I have fulfilled the purpose so that you don't have to keep lighting candles and trying to blow them out yourself. I have blown out once and for all, all sin for all time, for all people of all races. And all you have to do now is know that you can live a triumphant, victorious Christian life. Because victory doesn't have to do with your circumstances. Victory has to do with who lives in you. And that's what Paul's saying here. It's complete victory. Do you see the text? He made a public spectacle. What they would do in Rome when Rome would conquer, they would take the conquering army and they would strip them totally naked and they would embarrass them by leading them right in front of the whole city. They would take all of their weapons and they would strap them to their entourage of people and machinery and everything that was coming through and the chariots that were coming through. They would take those people who lost and they would make a public spectacle of them and they would march them right in front of the city. That's what Paul's saying. And Paul is saying that the cross has been marched right in front of us and Jesus Christ hung on that cross because he loved us with an everlasting love and we are now triumphant over everything. We don't move 
to victory, we move from it because victory lives inside of us. And so we have complete salvation, verse 13. We have complete forgiveness, verse 14. And we have complete victory, verse 15. I want you to turn to a, a prophetic Old Testament book that teaches us what this word forgiveness means. And to Zechariah, turn to Zechariah chapter 5. Now, Zach, now, now, don't act like you know where it is. Just go look, all right? I can pre-mark these things because I, I usually know where I'm going ahead of time. Maybe minutes ahead, but I know. So the idea of the word forgiveness and the disarming and the triumphing over so all of our sins have been sent away, have been sent away. And I want you to listen to me carefully as we close this message out so that when we sing, you alone can rescue, we understand that salvation is in him. So Zechariah chapter 5, this is a prophetic, it's an etymo etymological word that describes the word forgiveness. I know that's a big word, describes the word forgiveness in a prophetic sense in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament. So Zechariah chapter 5. Verses 5 through 11. And here's what the text says, and this is describing forgiveness, being sent away. Then the angel who talked with me came out and said to me, Lift up your eyes now and see that this is, see what this is that goes forth. So I asked, What is it? And he says, It is a basket that is going forth. So we have a basket, if you get the picture, of a basket going in the sky. And so the angel is saying, Pay attention to this. There's a basket going into the sky. All right? And it says this. He also said, this is their resemblance throughout the earth. The basket is going forth. This is their resemblance throughout the earth. Here is a lead disc lifted up, and this is a woman sitting inside the basket. So you have a basket with a, um, a lead disc, and, and it is uh, pulled back, and there is a woman sitting inside this basket. All right? This is a, a, a vision of forgiveness here. Then he said... This is wickedness. That's sin. And he thrust her down into the basket and threw the lead cover over its mouth. So we've got a basket with a lady sitting in it with a lead cover. And the angel says, shut the, shut the lead cover over. Put wickedness and sin inside the basket. That's what is happening here. That's the, that's the word picture in the Old Testament explaining our word forgive in the New Testament. So you get the picture. And here's what happened. Look at verse 9. Then I raised my eyes. This is very important. And looked, and there were two women coming with the wind in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. Here it is. So you got these, these two women. This basket is being lifted. There's a, there's a lead cover. There's a picture of sin inside the basket, but there's been a heavy cover put over that. And, and the women, the, the basket is being taken away. Where is it being taken to? Verse 10, so I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they carrying the basket? And he said to me, to build a house, for in it, in the land of Shinar, when it is ready, the basket will be set there on its base. This is important. You know where Shinar is? It's in a desolate place. Take this basket with this picture of sin, with a heavy cover over it, and get it as far away as you possibly can in a desolate place. Now let me give you the word picture here. Jesus took the sin in the basket. We were born into sin, we were born into wickedness, and he took the sin, your sin, my sin that was nailed to the cross, and the lead cover went over the basket. And the Bible says that when we trust Christ as our Savior, he removes our sin as far as, as the east is from the west. He takes that basket, and that lead cover is the picture of sin, and he takes it off into oblivion, and we can never see it anymore. Now, if God in Jesus Christ has forgiven us, what are we doing bringing up our sins? See, God remembers them no more, but what do we fight with every day? We remember what we did. And we can't get past our past unless we realize he has forgiven us. He has sent it away. If he has sent it away, listen, quit talking about it. Quit talking about it. It's over. It has been nailed to the cross. That's what Paul is saying. And so in this passage of Scripture, when he talks about the certificate of death, two things he's saying. Number one, they would take and they would write on a... Um, some papyrus that came from a plant. They would write whatever the sin was, whatever the debt was, you would write it. 
But the ink that they wrote with didn't have any acid in it, so it wasn't acidic, so it didn't, it didn't go into the papyrus. It was just on the surface. So the idea was, when Paul's talking about the certificate of debt that has been erased or wiped out, the handwriting of requirements against us, it's been wiped out. What Paul is saying is you could take in that day, it wasn't etched into the papyrus, you could take like a sponge and just wipe away the sins. And what Paul is saying is exactly what is happening in this prophetic word here in Zechariah, that God has taken our sin, and he has put it as far away as he can, and it has been taken care of. There's a lead cover never to, revi- to visit us anymore. Do you know that there are some people this morning right here in this church that are still dealing with sins that you committed 30 years ago? 30 years ago. Why did I do that? I want to encourage you today. It's all been paid for. It has all been paid for. Ladies and gentlemen, we are free in Jesus Christ. We have complete salvation. We have complete forgiveness. And we have complete victory. And that's why we can sing, You Alone Can Rescue. Would you pray with me this morning? My prayer for you is that you... And I would understand today what Paul is saying to the church at Colossae. That it's not about legalism, it's about life. It's not about keeping a list of rules so that you can keep your candles lit a little longer and you'll blow them out and you'll think you still have to pay for those. Paul says, no, the Lord that loves us has sent our sin away. He nailed it to the cross. So if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, I want to invite you to come and trust Jesus as your Savior. And you can be free today. Because some of you right now are thinking about the candle that keeps coming back. And you're thinking about that sin that's haunting you. It's haunting you even right now as we as we close out in prayer. This sin is in your mind. Can I tell you what? God does not have a memory problem. It's not in his mind. He chooses to forget. He chooses to forget. And for some today, you need to choose to forget, let it go, drop it. The lid has been placed over the basket and it is no longer because you're crippled in your Christian life because of things you did years ago. And Paul says Easter's every day. And whatever decision you need to make today, you make it before God. Jeremy and I are going to be at, the, on these, at these front rows right here at the front row. We're going to be singing, facing Nathan and the team. You can come and pray. You can come and pray all by yourself. You can pray where you are. If you have a decision that you want to make today, just grab one of us by the arm, that tap us on the shoulder. We'll let you know how to come to Christ as your Savior. For moms today, could you worship like you've never worshiped today? Could you sing this song knowing that He alone is your rescue? Father, we come today just trusting you. We open our hearts and our lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand where you are? If you need a Lord could save themselves, their own soul could heal. Our shame was deeper than the sea. Your grace was deeper still. Oh Lord, sing it. save themselves their own soul could heal our shame was deeper than the sea your grace is deeper still and you alone can rescue you alone can save you
Lift up.